Hello everyone, welcome to the Villa Together podcast with myself, Chris Ellis, and I'm delighted to say that today I'm joined by a very special guest, which is Mr. James Merry. James, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me on. No problem. Thanks for coming on. Um, and as you can see, James is a Villa fan, and that is the reason we're talking to him today. So, James, just just kind of tell us, you go back right to the start, how you became a Villa fan. Okay, um, my nan uh was born on Whitton road oh. um which is probably a good start um but then uh so it's my mom's side of the family that were pro- predominantly villa my dad actually controversially is a cov boy he's from coventry so i didn't follow after my dad in supporting cov um but yeah and then my great aunt was a massive fan growing up she was a season ticket holder for about 50 years something like that um i think she was still going the season that she passed away um so yeah I, I didn't have a lot of choice really <laughs> there you go um what about so you you kind of become a villa fan obviously there's a family connection what about when you first started like supporting the club and following them what are your kind of earliest memories so so maybe watching them on the tv or going to a game i thought you might ask me this i've got my first i've got my first ticket stuff look at that oh, look at that that is preparation so what that we're there is- Villa versus Derby, 2nd of February, 1991. Wow, look at that. And so that was like, um, who, who, who do I remember from that area? Obviously, people, like, I, I tend to remember some of the more random players, like Kevin Gage. Yeah. And people like that. And Kent, Kent Nielsen, um, obviously Platty. Yeah. Um, and I can remember that game as well, because it wasn't long after the World Cup. And they had uh, Derby had Shilton in goal and Mark Wright in defence. Oh wow! I remember thinking it was quite cool to see some England players as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, and then of course they had Dean Saunders playing for the like who later joined us. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was my first game, Villa against Derby, uh, ninety one, and the rest is history. Do you remember what the score was in that game? Oh, Jesus, I knew you were going to ask me that next. I don't know. I'll have to get on eleven versus eleven. I've I've got it up. I've just quickly. Oh, you got it up. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. Good. I've just quickly done a search. I've got it up. Um, Villa won three two. Mm. So that's it's a good game. So that's yeah, game exa- exactly. That's a good. That's a good first game to go to. Um, <laughs> goal scorers. I don't know if you remember the goal scorers. I've got the. I've got. I've got the program here. Do you have a look at the program? Remember the goal scorers. Let's have a look at the sides. Uh, Platt Cascarino. Yeah, Tony Cascarino got one. Cowans. Yeah, penalty. Um, Ormond Droid. No, it was um, someone who started on the bench. Ooh. Dwight York? Yes, it was Dwight York. Oh, I feel like we're doing a quiz now. I like this. <laughs> <laughs> Try ask, who scored for Derby? Uh, Saunders. No, he didn't. No, I don't know. I won't get that one. Mick Harford and Mel Sage. Oh, blimey. Right, yeah. There's a couple of old names. Yeah. See, look, at that. Yeah. I, I, like, I like that preparation from you to, you know, with your, your ticket stub. <laughs> Didn't know the score, though. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it happens so many so many times you speak to people. I remember my first game, they, they remember something from a game. I remember my first yeah. game, I remember this happening also on scoring and things like that. And like you say, you know, Dean Saunders playing, Peter Shilton, Mark Rock. What about, so when you were younger... Yeah, those, those are the players. You're younger, you, you're following the club. Kind of how often did you did you kind of go to the games? Um, I went quite a lot. Um, my uh, great aunt would take me or my dad would take me reluctantly. And then in the late 90s, so when I was 17, I would have been in, would have been summer holidays from sixth form. Um, I actually got a job at the ground, uh, working for the ground catering company. Oh, nice. Um, I think it was privately, um, like, like they, they franchised it out before that. And then there was a decision made to run the ground, the ground catering. So that's like the, you know, the burgers and the pies and everything Yeah. Um, internally. And so I can remember spending, yeah, the summer of 98, basically prepping all the executive boxes ready for the new season, prepping all the kiosks ready for the new season and being like, you know, just like a kid in a candy shop. It was brilliant. Just having complete access to the ground. Um, you could go where you want. And then, um, the, when the season started, I, I think I did it for about five years, even when I moved down here to um, to drama school. Uh, I think I, 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 I used to travel back every weekend to, to, to do it. 
Um, but yeah, you just, you'd have a radio and you'd make sure that they got the burgers and the pies in the right kiosks. So for that period, I was at every game, every single game, um, I was working and you'd probably get to watch the last half an hour or so. Yeah. So yeah what a dream job that would have been. I'd have loved to have done that. Be it there. was as a, as a teenager, it was, and you know, you'd, you'd have a wristband to let you get past stewards and stuff like that. Oh, it was brilliant. Just, uh, although... One story, one story that sticks in my mind, my, my biggest regret was uh, we used to get paid um, cash in a little brown envelope. You used to have to go to the, the catering, catering office to get paid. And the semi final, the FA Cup semi final, um, Man United against Arsenal, I was working on that game. Um, and the, the gig's goal where he takes his shirt off. Yeah. I thought, this is going to penalties, I'm going to go and get paid. So there I am in the in the catering office and they've got a little TV in the corner and I'm watching it and I, he's going, he's going, he's going all the way. Oh my God, I've just, I, I haven't seen that live. Oh no, oh no. <laughs> I was what? in the ground, but uh, yeah, I didn't see that kicks, that kicks go live. It was, um, yeah. See, that that's, that's something um, that I imagine most people, and you, you probably will agree as well, a lot of people have mentioned FA Cup semi-finals really shouldn't be played at Wembley. They should be played at neutral venues. And they were brilliant when they were played at, at the likes of, you know, it was Villa Park and Old Trafford or, you know, Villa yeah. Park and, uh, and Anfield and stuff like that. And I thought it was brilliant. And that's almost like, that's the kind of magic of, of the cup. Exactly. And, and Wembley was special then, wasn't it? And yeah, you, yeah the, the Southern clubs would have their semi-final at Villa Park. The Northern clubs would have their semi-final at, at Old Trafford or however they worked it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was. It's, I, I can also remember working the um, Cup Winners' Cup final. Do you remember that when that the last ever Cup Winners' Cup final was at Villa Park, which was, um, was Mallorca, Mallorca against Lazio. When was that? 2000, um, 2001 or something. Something like that, or maybe nine, ninety nine, something like that. Um, but yeah, that that that, they, that it was always used as a as a great venue, wasn't it? For as a, as a neutral venue. Yeah, I mean, you, you look at, um, I think, Euro 96, we had a few games, didn't we? Villa Park uh, mm. for, the, for the group stages. And I think yeah. I think, I think people people tend to to forget whether it's because of this kind of, you know, this big six kind of dominance and whatever. They forget how good of a ground Villa Park is. It's, you know, and it has got that prestige of, as you say, hosted the, you know, the Cup Winners' Cup, as we've mentioned about FA Cup semi-final. It's got that prestige. Of hosting big events, yeah, yeah, and, it, and obviously I wasn't around, but hosted games in '66 as well. Yeah. Um, uh, but I think I don't know. Maybe the last 15, 20 years, there's been a bit of a fashion, hasn't there, for the, the wraparound grounds, the, yeah. the you know the the all in ones, the new builds. Whereas Villa's still very much those four distinct stands. There's there's been rumours for ages, haven't there, about them yeah. developing the north stand into a wraparound to connect. Yeah, um, that that would look nice, but yeah, it is a massively historic stadium. Um, when I when when I first started working there, the old um, the old Trinity Road stands was still um, in action, and you go into the McGregor Suite or something like that. And I, some people might have been to wedding receptions there and stuff, but it was just Victorian splendor. It was oak panelled, had that kind of musty smell. Um, there was, was so much history in it. Yeah, it's yeah, it's a it's an amazing ground, and I took my youngest there. Um, it must have been in the summer last summer, um, and it's almost like I was stood in the ground, and we went for a tour. Stood yeah. in stood in the ground, and it was like you could feel the atmosphere that you you know because you know what it's like when you're in in the, you're watching the games, um, and it's such a shame that we haven't been able to to do that for so long. Um, what yeah. what about growing up watching Villa? You kind of, I suppose, your, your fondest memories, you know, the kind of maybe your favourite game or, or, or kind of goals, goals and players watching that you, that stand out? Favourite game uh, always has to be just for the atmosphere. And ironically, it's a game that we didn't progress from. Um, Atletico Madrid, um, lower hole. What was it 97, 98 UEFA Cup quarter final? Yep. Um, I, th- I can't remember. Had we drawn, I think we drawn in Madrid. And um, I can remember the last half an hour, Colin Moore put one in that came off the bar, I think. I remember Colin, we were playing in white. Screamer, yeah. Colin Moore belted one in. And I can remember Lee Hendry being on the edge of the six-yard box and receiving it. He just had to tuck it past the keeper. Yeah. And it was a decent shot. And I don't know, the, the Atletico keeper grew a third arm and it went round the post. Yeah. Um, but I don't think I've been 
um, a, a better atmosphere at Villa Park than that night. That that sticks in the memory. Yeah, we um, it was Stan Collymore's birthday last week, and I posted a clip on Twitter of him scoring that goal. Oh, um, yeah. A lot of people in the comments were kind of saying that watching that video, you can almost feel the atmosphere of that game because the the yeah. roof the roof lifted off. You know, the metaphorical roof lifted off when that goal went in, didn't it? It was it was electric. Um, I, I I think I went to all the home games in that run as well. We had um, Bordeaux, Bill Bauer. Booker at Star all, yeah. all, all the all, all the beats. Um and then yeah, then you had Christmas and New Year, and then I think the, the, the quarterfinals were after that, were they? I don't know, I can't remember. Yeah. Um but those European that European season um lives long in the memory, special times. Yeah, that it's one of them. I think there's been a lot of debate questions and I suppose a lot of shade thrown at the Europa League. Um, because I think you think back at the UEFA Cup and when we took part in it, it was great. I mean, even when we took part in the, you know, the Martin O'Neill era and stuff like that, I suppose we didn't treat it as well as maybe we'd have liked to have done. But the Europa League these days, it's almost like people take part and it's kind of like a bit of a, you know, a joke to, to be in it instead of Champions League. But I would love to, you know, to have those European days back because they, course, there's, yeah. there's, there's something else that they're totally different to, you know, domestic football. Yeah, and, and, and I think, like you said, Ben, unfortunately, a lot of the clubs that end up in it are disappointed to be there because their aspirations were for Champions League. Yeah. Um, but when, you know, when we were competing in it in those seasons in the 90s, uh, we were thrilled to be there in a way, you know. Um, and I, I, th I think that, that that has crept in now that it's seen as the, uh, the runners up price. Um, which, which is not because of the format that they put it in now as, as a league in the first round. I think it's quite exciting. Um, we had an experience, didn't we, about 10 years ago when it first became the Europa League and we, we beat Ajax. Yep. Um, can't remember, we had Hamburg as well, didn't we? People like that. Yeah. Um, I think that was probably the last time we were in it, weren't we? Yeah, I remember that that Ajax game because um, I remember looking at the the programme beforehand and I was thinking, what, what a team. And a lot of those players went on to play in the Premier League. You had... Um, you know, a team that we played played against Ajax. They had Vertonghen, Vermaelen, I think Alderweireld possibly, Luis Suarez was playing. In that uh, side? Yeah, yeah, that we that played against us when we beat Ajax. Blimey, that is amazing. Yeah, I mean, and um, yeah, I think we were 2-0 up and I think all 1-0 up and they equalised and then Martin Larson scored a header. Um, but yeah, I'm, yeah. I, just, I just remember sat there before the game and I looked at the back of the programme I was like, wow. Some of these players, you know, Luis Suarez before he, he went to to Liverpool, and, and and you know a lot of a lot of you know we've had a lot of Dutch players in the Premier League, haven't we? And it was, um, yeah, that was that was an experience. You know, I know it was like you say, a different format being in the, the group. I think I think you're right. I think we had Ajax, Hamburg, and possibly someone like Litex. Oh gosh, yeah, Litex Lovic. Or yeah, yeah, like yeah. <laughs> they wore orange, and I remember that because they outside the ground they had the. They weren't even half and half scarves. They were scarves that had the whole group on it. Yes, yes, yes. Were they? Where's that? Is that Croatia or Serbia or something like that? Litex, Lovic. Somewhere. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, uh, yeah. There was, the, but that, yeah, those kind of games were brilliant. Um, you know, depending on how it's, it's one of them. It obviously depends how how well we do this season. Whether we can kind of bring European football back, but as well, I suppose the main thing is how soon can we have the fans back? Because that's that's obviously something that we. We kind of want. And um, what about all the players that you've seen? So I suppose you know you you've the eras you've seen, um, you know in the in the late eighties, early nineties. I suppose we we had that success, relatively decent success in the nineties, the two thousands. Mm. We were we were there thereabouts, and then obviously we took it to another level under Martin O'Neill. What about the the players? So I suppose two two questions. Yep. What what players have kind of stood out for you over there, and who you, over those years who you've really enjoyed watching, and also what kind of era have you enjoyed the most that you've kind of seen? I think the era, just because it was quite magical, being still still being a kid, was the mid nineties with the um, the League Cup wins that yeah. side of um, McGrath, Townsend, Richardson, Teal, uh, Bosnich, um, those, those kind of players, and and winning it. 
uh, winning it to you know in 94 and 96 kind of sport you a little bit and thought oh well this is what it's always like we win a cup every couple of years yeah um and then we got to the fa cup final in 2000 you say oh right well i've, I've, I've waited i've waited four years so yeah this is a regular event um and then some of the 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 the, the, the crapper times came later but no if i had to pick an era i'd pick the mid 90s yeah that side that i've just talked about um obviously yorkie as well you go um and some unsung heroes in that side as well, like Sean Teal. Yeah. Um, Neil Cox would always come in and do a job. He was like the utility player, wasn't he? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And then going more into adult life, I suppose, um, into the noughties, uh, Gareth Barry sticks in the mind because he was always there, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, for, for, for so long. Um, Juan Pablo, um, although I, I suppose he's, his goal return wasn't what a lot of people wanted, but some of his goals were brilliant. And also just that kind of foreign flair, you know, having a striker with that long yeah. dark hair, it's just a bit exciting, isn't it? Um, and then in the last, in the, go, going into the the, the, the teenies, uh, the, I'd probably pick out Ben Teke, doing his best to keep us up for a couple of years. Yep. Um but obviously it wasn't um, a classic time to be a Villa fan. And then last last few years, there's there's not another candidate, is there, apart from Jack? Um, you know, my my little lad's seven and he's just absolutely fascinated. And I just tell him to watch him play and look at the time that he has on the ball and the way that the ball just he looks like he's got super glue on his boot. Um, and, you know, if, they, if, if somebody wants the ball, then they're going to have to kick him for it. Yeah, yeah, he's... Um... Obviously, you've you've listed so many good players there. Um, you know, most of whom that I've kind of grown up watching as well. And you kind of think we've had all these great players to watch, but then when you, when you think of Jack Grealish now, oh yeah, you know, really he is. If if not at the top, he's very close to you know. Certainly, when you look at the kind of players that me and you would have seen. Yeah, especially now. I mean, there's been some comparisons with Gaza, aren't there? And I mean, the, the 1990 World Cup was the first um, World Cup I can remember. Um, and people call them, some people call them luxury players, don't they? But yeah. to me, that's football. If somebody you can run and travel with with the football like that. I mean, all right, you get dead ball. You, you know, people who can ping it around like Beckham or Gerrard and people like that. But yeah. Somebody who can actually carry the ball and take two or three players out in a, in a three or four seconds. That's that's That gets the heart beating. Yeah, I mean, some of the things that he does, and it's especially last season, there were so many times when we were poor and he just pulled us out of it. And I think the whole story around him as well, you know, local lad, you know, he's grown yeah. up, he, he, I suppose he's gone through, he's had, certainly he's had some lows and more recently he's had some highs at the club. And I don't think there's a, there's a single, certainly not an Aston Villa fan, that that kind of, you know, doesn't love him. You know, I think every, every Aston Villa fan adores him. And it's got to the point now where, majority of other football clubs fans are starting to kind of stand up and say, do you know what, aside from his, it seemed like it was a, you know, aside from his floppy hair and his shin pads and that kind of stuff, people now are thinking, do you know what, he's, he's, he's at the top of his game, he's up there with the best in the league. Absolutely, if not the world. I saw some chart the other day that was, I don't know, on different axis and one was carries into the penalty area, the other one was um, chances created. Yeah. And he was he was ahead of like Neymar, ahead of um, Mbappe. Um, obviously, that starts to create the kind of attention that as Villa fans we don't want. Yeah. Um, and I think now we're in a we, we we're in a, a difficult spot with Jack because maybe two three years ago a lot of Villa fans wouldn't have begrudged him the move and they would have been like, well, you know, he's he's done his best for this. But now we're on the brink of actually starting to do well again. Yeah. Um, and and put as you said, push p potentially for that European spot. It's like I'd, I'd, if someone did come in for it, I'd be like, no, no, yeah. you just don't. You can do you you can you can maybe have that success with us. Um, but yeah, we'll, I guess we'll see what happens on that front. Yeah, I mean, I suppose there's, there's similar comparisons to you look at like ninety eight, ninety nine. Um, we we were doing relatively well. We were we were a, a top four side before. The top four was was a kind of thing, you know, it's top four, but it was top top two for Champions League. Top four was the like yeah. UEFA Cup. And then it looked like we were, you think, of, you know, like you mentioned, you go, we had Gareth Southgate, Ian Taylor, a, a good core. And then we had Gareth, uh, Dwight York up top. 
Yeah. And, and you thought, do you know what? We, we could do well here. He left. We were on, yeah. it seemed like we were on the, the kind of brink of something good. And obviously with Jack now, it's almost similar, similar thing. Obviously we had, we had, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, Ben Teke and I suppose those times when Ben Teke was part of and then when he left, we were almost treading water, weren't we, to kind of stay up in the Premier League? Oh, those, it was, it was just that, I mean, in between O'Neill leaving and relegation in 16, what was those, those six years, that was a bit of torture watching them some, some seasons yeah. because we were just, as you say, treading water. And I think we did quite well to get another six years in the Premier League, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Before nice. we had, it eventually went. And Chris, it's interesting you say that. You say like the late 90s and now where we are now. So it's almost going in like 10 years cycles because in the O'Neill era, 07, 08, 09, we were on the verge of something then as well. Yeah. Um, you know, with Ashley Young, Stuart down in those, those and Barry Milner. And there was gonna and, and there was gonna be one that broke into that top four out of what Spurs, us and Everton. Yeah. As it turned out, it was Spurs. Um and y- you know, we lost O'Neill and Spurs went up, qualified for the Champions League. Um but yeah, I think we're at one of those junctions again. And um it's difficult. Just gotta keep him. Please stay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You know, you go from that time, you know, the times we mentioned, the 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 kind of, I suppose, the end of, of our Premier League stint, getting relegated. How how kind of good does it feel now supporting a club where, where it almost every kind of box is being ticked in terms of, of leadership on and off the pitch with the owners, you know, likes of Christian Perslow and things like that. How good, how good does it feel being a Villa fan and, and kind of following the club where everything seems to be in place? I think I think you you start to feel a bit a bit more connected to the team that you support, especially um, when you're going to watch them and you you know you you're paying your money, you're buying your merchandise. It's not uh, some ditter, you know. You know, Randy Lerner in his last few years couldn't have cared less, really, could he? And you, 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 it just feels like a business. Yeah. Um, but now with the manager and with the owners um, and and Prince William. Uh, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. It just it's it's a good time, and it it's a good time, and you and I, I think uh, some of the media coverage that we get now is getting a little bit more positive, um, and we we seem to be mentioned in the right company um, than we were for those years of, up until us getting relegated. Yeah. Um, uh, it's interesting to see sometimes on Twitter some of the comments when we play a big boy, and you know, like. Some of them saying, oh, you know, when we beat Liverpool 7-2. And some of the people saying, oh, you know, who are Aston Villa? You know, they're, they're, they're a yo-yo team. I was like, a yo-yo team? Yeah, yeah ridiculous. <laughs> rele- relegated once, mate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In the, in the Premier League era, relegated once. And, you know, obviously we've come back up. So it's a lot of people, I think, they, they kind of get get frustrated and they just think, oh, Villa, got, Villa went down, they've come back up, they're a yo-yo team. You're like, no. You know, yeah, we, and they're probably probably quite new to football as well. Some of yeah, them. exactly. They start yeah started supporting in what twenty fifteen probably. Uh, yeah. Well, following football. Um, what about so this team now? We're playing pretty well. We're eighth in the league with two games in hand. We seem to be kind of competitive. We, we pretty much everyone we play. Um, you know, obviously we lost recently against Man United and Man City, but you know back back into winning ways against Newcastle after the the kind of issues we had with COVID. What are your kind of thoughts on this current team and your kind of, I suppose, hopes and expectations for, for the season ahead? Um, my thoughts, I've said it after the Man City game um, last week, it doesn't matter who we play and the quality of players that they've got. If you want to score against this Villa team, you've got to be your best at the moment. Yeah. And you know, what was it? How long did we last out? 75 minutes, something like that. Yeah. Um, and a, a couple of a couple of questionable um, decisions, um, but that's that's what I think's been lacking over there. Even there was even times in the championship where we seemed to have a bit of a soft belly, um, and and we'd, we'd 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 concede against lesser sides. Now we can go up against any of the top four or five sides, and I just sit down. I sit down to watch it on the telly, and I think, you know, what? I'm 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 not seeing a beat in there, which I I I, I was in the past. You know, I was almost reluctantly sitting down. And, Oh, this is this is going to be torture, um, but there, there seems to have that steel, that spirit, that fight that we that, that, that we're not going to lose. We've also come back, haven't we, a couple of times this season after conceding the first goal um, for, for 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 a draw. 
was it? I can't remember who we drew. Was it Chelsea or Burnley or someone like that? Yeah, um, one nil down against Chelsea. We, we yeah, came back, which which is something that we we haven't really done. You know, kind of I say historically over the last however many years, we, something that we don't really do. We kind of go behind and end yeah. up losing usually. So. Um, and going forward, um, if we can keep everybody fit, we've just added this. Has it been confirmed yet? We added this French lad, Samson. Not yet. Um, I think it probably will do over the next couple of couple of days. Yeah, I don't see where he fits into the side at the moment, but it's great to have that depth. Yeah. Um, if, if if we can keep McGinn, Louis, um, and Jack and Ollie fit, then uh, it's difficult. And it, you start to get spoiled by some really good performances. And at the beginning of the season, you would have yeah. taken seventeenth. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Um, but now you start, now you start to see the way that they're playing, and you're thinking, oh yeah, could we, could we nick a, nick a European place? I don't know. Yeah. I won't be disappointed if we don't because of the progress we've made. Um, but expectations that would be wonderful. I don't know what you've got to be this year, six, seventh, something like that, depending on who wins the cup or something. Yeah, it's, it's it, top six. I think is a guarantee, is guaranteed. But you could finish seventh, depending on if if another team wins um, wins you know what other team wins the cup. So you know Man City if they win the FA Cup, then it drops down a place. So there's, there's potential there because I, I think historically you kind of I suppose seventh, eighth downwards to twelfth or something. There's not a lot a lot in it. Um, but so yeah, yeah, that's what I, that's that 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 would be my expectation. If we can start knocking on the door of Europe again over the next few years and. And just keep building. Don't sell. Try not to sell it. I mean, Jack's an exception. He'll get suitors from you know with very yeah. deep pockets. Um, but if we can keep a core together um, of, of of players, because they seem they seem like they like each other as well as a group. Yeah. Some of the some of the little videos they've got. There was Ross Bartley chucking one in a snowballing concert face or something. <laughs> yeah. Yesterday when they, um, they 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 seem like a group that likes each other. Unlike four or five years ago, you know that. Um, uh, Lesker and um, oh, the other centre around Mika Richard, you know, there was there was yeah. so it, it just seemed like there was something sour in that squad because they were losing every week, probably. Um, but yeah, they, they, it's 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 a positive squad that they've got now, and I think if we can keep some the, the core of it together, then we could do something over the next few years. Yeah, I think it's certainly key what you mentioned about the the kind of being a positive squad. Because you can see, as, as you know, we see on social media, and obviously we don't know all the ins and outs, what goes on, but it does seem to be a happy camp, and I think that makes a massive difference. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you know, you were hearing some of them breaking lockdown and being in, in trouble, you know, and then I was, I was reading, it was it Jack Jack met up with um, with Ross or something yeah. like that? And he showed, yeah. I'm like, I'm like, that's terrible. You shouldn't break the rules. But you know what? That means they're actually mates. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, well uh, apparently it was, um, I think, Dean Smith wanted Ross Barkley obviously this was the start of the season wanted Ross Barkley to come and I think Jack Grealish was like texting him like for two weeks straight trying to get yeah. him to come yeah. so it's good and then obviously it's good that as you say that they've got that connection because and, you know, and getting those pals now in the England squad as well you know um, getting yeah. to know some of those players is always a positive yeah certainly helps going forward and it's kind of like now we can especially the last the last two three years it's almost like there's that I don't want to say light at the end of the tunnel but it kind of helps us push forward and kind of forget the the rubbish times we had like when we mentioned about treading water and just staying up every year and it was no fun was it you know the looks of under Paul Lambert and stuff like that it's, it's kind of good to have, have moved on quite a fair bit from there well that's football isn't it that's supporting a proper football team good times and bad times the, the good times <laughs> would be as good if you hadn't gone through the bad right yeah exactly. um, you, you know you look at it what what Last few years, technically, been a bad time for Man United supporters. It's like, come on. <laughs> well, yeah, um, exactly. So it's all different levels, isn't it? But no, um, yeah, hopefully they can do something. I don't think Dean will go anywhere anytime soon. And the, the owners seem completely committed yep. financially. And it's great not to have that, like so many clubs still in the Premier League do, that financial burden of thinking, well, we, yeah, we've got to sell this player um, or we, we, we've got to do this deal. We don't, we, we don't have any worries financially, which is absolutely brilliant and testament to them for, for coming in. Um, with, with, with no real affinity to the club either, was yeah. there? From um, Wes Edens and, so I don't know how you say his name, Sawari, is it? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, no, as far as I'm aware, I suppose when you, you kind of think about it there, um, obviously they've, they've got links to, especially Wes Edens got links to other um, sports clubs in the US. Yeah. Um, so he's got that kind of background, but I think you know you're looking at it and you think, well, you know, a side in Birmingham 
without knowing too much about English football, you think, oh, okay, there's there's potential there. Yeah. Um, so so I think he's gone from that. Like, as you say, they seem committed, which is you know is amazing for for owners to come in, like you say, possibly with no affinity to the club, and to be that committed, it's, it's been incredible. It's absolutely, and you, you know. Um, financially, to have that comfort is is is, is brilliant. And, and like you say, it's a cliche, isn't it? But sleeping giant. If they look, if someone's looking around to invest in a Premier League club or a Championship club, we were always the key candidate. Yeah. Yep. Um, probably along with your Leeds or your Forest or someone like that, with that massive supporter base. Yeah. Um, and being in a big city, so um, yeah, hopefully it's the the, the dawning of a new era. Yeah, let's hope so. What about so? Obviously, you, you touched on, you mentioned earlier about moving to, uh, you moved to go to drama school. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I went to Guildford School of Acting um, in Surrey, just outside London. Um, lived in London for a bit. Now, um, when kids were on the way, we moved back out to um, Guildford. So that's where I am now, Guildford in Surrey. Bit of a football wasteland, Surrey. Yeah. Um, the, uh, I think that the, the highest ranked team is Woking. Um, oh, in nice. the conference, yeah. who I do, I do take my lad to see. They're a lovely little non-league club, get about two or three thousand, um, and it's a great opportunity for him to watch live football as well as can't go every every week up to Villa Park up to Brom. But um, I tried to take him to some of the London London games as well when when we could. Um, but yeah, I've been to all the London grounds. Probably Fulham would be my favourite since I've been down there. Love the full. It's good to have the Fulham trip back um, if we're allowed back in and if they stay up, of course. Um, but yeah, that's down, down here. There's a few Villa fans um, that, that live around. Um, my, uh, if, funny, can you see this hanging up here, this blanket? Yeah. So this, um, when, when our eldest was born, we did NCT, you know, those parenting classes. Yeah. And uh, I sat down and so I said to him, he says, I'm not going to enjoy this. They're all going to be bankers and lawyers and things like that. And it's just going to be boring. Sat down next to this bloke and I said, uh, thought oh, I'd better be polite. Hello, mate. My, my name's James. And he said, all right, mate. My name's Steve. <laughs> Straight away. Who do you support? Villa. Where are you from? Tamworth. Brilliant. Best there you mates. Go. Yep. <laughs> and he, yeah, he gave me that. Um, oh, nice. That, 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 that blanket. So, yeah, we've got, um, we've got a few, few Villa fans down here. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's me now, living in Surrey. So, I mean, you just kind of touched on it. Has it been, I suppose... You know, it's a, it's a it's a tough one being able to get to Villa Park, travelling from Surrey. Kind of how often have you, since you've been down there? How often have you been able to to get to Villa Park? A few times a season, I'd say uh, four or five times. Um, I've still got family um, up up in Brom that I stay with when I go up, and I, t- I take my eldest Theo. Um, so I probably see them. Last when was it like on the season before all this COVID business started? I probably went up about four times and saw them four times down here as well. Yeah, it's difficult. It's difficult to get the away tickets now though, because you know quite rightly it goes to the season ticket holders. Yeah, um, and it's, and sometimes the away the away tickets are completely sold out. But now I suppose that comes um, hand in hand with having some success. Yeah, exactly. What would you? What would your kind of typical match day experience be? I, Oh, it's obviously going to be very different now, but what about pre-COVID and post-COVID? What would your kind of typical match day experience be? Ooh. Going to Villa Park, I always used to, um, from the direction coming where I grew up, um, we used to have a drink in the U, I don't know if it's still there anymore, the U Tree, the U Tree pub. Um, I think it's on Brookvale Road. That would be where, where we'd have a drink before. Yep. Burger, um, drop into the, the Villa shop. Um, so yeah, spend spend a fortune. Um, more now going with my son because he yeah. wants everything in there. Um, and I was I always used to like to get into the ground early. I like yeah. to say one of one of those that would be the probably half an hour, forty five minutes uh, before, just to soak up a little bit of the atmosphere, see them warming up. Um, you know, see who looks sharp, who doesn't, see who's talking to who, who's pals with who, you know, who's bantering. Um, so yeah, that would be my. My pre-match routine when I was when when I was in in, in Brum. Um, nowadays, yeah, it's much more family centred and, and doing kids stuff. They they did a brilliant thing um, for my eldest it's called my home debut. I yeah. think you could pay twenty quid for the the if you're taking your son or daughter for their for the first time. And uh, we got to walk around the track 
um, and and see the see the players really close. And they had in oh the old cricket centre the, by the shop. I don't know what it's called now, the Villa Academy or something like that. They had all yeah. kids' activities laid out, so they're doing things really classy now, which is great. Yeah, no, no it's it's good that. Um... That they've kind of not that it not that it wasn't, but certainly it's it's more of a family experience. If you know if you go with your children and stuff like that, which is nice because I think growing up, um, it's very different for for maybe the likes of me and you compared to to kids now. I think it just kind of gives them an opportunity to have that bit more of an affection to the club from from an early day. God, yeah, I can remember when I first started guys in, in the early nineties. My mum and my aunt, who was the same ticket, I was I was banned from. Um, trying to get a ticket in the old end you know that is, is, that if you'd listen to my mum you would have thought you wouldn't come out alive she's like oh no don't don't go in the old end because yeah. it was standing then yeah. um and you know they, they, they'd surge forward and everything um but uh yeah yeah it is now it's got a real family family feel to it which i think is good for me nurtures the next generation of fans as well yeah i had um so my eldest he's not really into football whereas my youngest is literally just kind of followed me and loves he'll, he'll be walking around just chanting super super jack and all this kind of yeah. stuff yeah. and he, like i'll go to the villa shop and, and buy a top for me and he wants the same as me and stuff like that so we went start of the season to to get new kit and stuff like that and my eldest came with us he's not a villa fan and you mentioned about spending loads in the shop Oh well, yeah, I, I ended up I ended up buying loads for for my non-supporting son who wanted a Villa oh. watch, Villa watch, and all this kind of stuff. But obviously, because he did not really into football, I was kind of like, yeah, because maybe it'll get him into football. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Why not? Absolutely. I mean, I've my, my I've got two, so I've got one who's just coming up three years old, and he's starting to get a little bit of an idea when we're watching the match or something, and what a yeah. goal is, and he'll scream goal. So yeah, they'll be what they'll be, won't they? But. um yeah. Yeah, as long as they're Villa, that's all right. They can support Woking as their second team, as their local team. But yeah, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> you got Woking. Um, so obviously, you mentioned going down to drama school, etc. What what kind of what was the I suppose the impetus behind wanting to get into act, acting? Um, my mum sent me to something called the Birmingham Stage School when I was about um, seven, eight, because I was always doing accents and voices and copying people off the telly. Um, so that was Birmingham Stage School. And then I went from there to something called the Central Junior Television Workshop. So do you remember when Midlands Television used to be Central? Yeah. Um, like on ITV, and then it became Carlton. And what they used to run this fabulous thing that was um, non, non-fee paying. So you go once or twice, I think it's twice a week sometimes, but you had to go through a really rigorous audition um, pr- procedure. So it was all loads of talented kids from around Birmingham and the Midlands. And you go every week and you put plays on. And it also served as a, a pool of talent for um, kids TV casting. So um, as a kid, you, you go for an audition for, I don't know, I had, a, I had a couple of lines in the Demon Headmaster and stuff like that as a kid. Um, so that was where I got into um, telly. And after that, going through my teens, I went to quite an academic school that didn't even do drama. No. Um, and so I, all my drama was outside of school, but I knew then that I just wanted to go to drama school and, um, and try and pursue it as a career, which I'm fortunate enough to have done. Um, being an actor doesn't mean that you're working wall to wall you have to find other things I do a lot of education work running workshops in schools um a lot of industries use actors that you probably wouldn't even guess like um medical training um so role play training stuff like that but then the tv work comes along as well and that's and and that's fantastic I might be doing panto this year um so fingers crossed uh for that um but yeah that's the life of an actor you know ups and downs Bit like a bit like the life of a villa supporter. Well, there you go. You're used to it. You're used to it. Support <laughs> supporting Villa is the same as, as as your career as an actor, ups and downs. What so yeah. you, <laughs> you mentioned about doing accents and copying people. Are there any are there any accents that you're kind of really good at or or any impressions of people that you're good at? Oh blimey, blimey. That you, that you can wow the fans with. <laughs> Me and my missus. Um, have this character that we do with each other <laughs> in a really deep it's, it's kind of I suppose it's observing people at Villa Park over the years um, and he's, he's called Mr A Villa uh, <laughs> Alan I can't believe I'm saying this on a podcast we usually do it in private 
and he's got this brummy accent that you can barely understand. And it's like I've watched old men at Villa Park over the years, and they they they'll stand up and shout something. He's like, I didn't I didn't understand a word of that. Yeah. <laughs> I hate because you've had a few beers, and just say because you've got the thickest brummy accent in the world. Yeah. Um, and that would be more like, you know, what are you wait for to do? Come on, what are you doing, people? Come on, yeah, oh, yeah, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I know, I know, I know that I know the bloke you're talking about. Yeah, there's a there's a there's a few few of them. Yeah, um, just... I've I've bottled that one, haven't I? Because I've just done a brummy accent rather than anything else. <laughs> That's quite well, you know. I mean, it's quite good, and I think a lot of people listening will probably be like, "I can relate to that. I know exactly the kind of fan that you mean." They kind of sit there a bit quiet, and then all of a sudden they'll get up and and say exactly how you've said it. Yeah, <laughs> almost totally. Um... Totally. Uh, you just can't understand them. But, you know, that's passion. It's brilliant. I love it. What about, is there, is there anyone that you, you kind of, um, any impressions that you do of anyone that you've that you, you watched on the TV? Um, I don't think so. I can do accents. Go on, give me an accent. Um, Scouse. Scouse. I can do uh, a Scouse accent. So, um, of course, it's everybody's dream to play for Liverpool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you, you know, not everybody can can do it. But um, yeah, Wayne Rooney always scratching his face when he's being interviewed. It's like, yeah, <laughs> is that all right? <laughs> yes, yes, love that one. Really, really good. Um, Cockney. Cockney. Oh, Cockney's easy. Uh, who, who should we do? Harry. Oh, big Harry. Yeah, yeah. Cockney's easy. Been down here a few years now. Um, yeah, just got to sound like you don't care all the time there. Yeah, everything's bought off a duck's, you know, bought off a duck's back, isn't it? Nah, nothing really matters. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Um, do uh, one, one more. Yeah. How's your Irish accent? Oh, northern or southern? Oh, let's go northern. Northern. Well, no, northern Irish often sounds like you want to kill somebody, don't you? Yeah, like it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's quite an aggressive accent. Hey, what, what you looking at me? Hey, 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 nay, ye dying target, nay. I'm not even saying words, <laughs> but you get the impression. Yeah, I'll go for a few jars before the game and then I'll go and find somebody and sort of me. Yeah, that is that is fantastic. That is wonderful. Wonderful. Gosh, I didn't know you were going to do that. Blimey. Like yeah, see, it's just one of them because you, you mentioned it. I thought I've got an opportunity now. <laughs> Because people, oh. people listening to this will love it. See, I, I can't do it. My wife is amazing at accents, honestly. There's been times when she's done it and people have been like, who's that? It's like, oh, it's, it's Beck. And they're like, what, what is she talking <laughs> like that for? And she does them perfectly. But I am, t- I am terrible. I can't do any accent. Someone tries to get me to do an accent and I just, I just come back to... I mean, I'm from... Um, I live in Stourbridge, so I'm more kind of Dudley, black country than Brummy. Um, yeah. But saying that, I, I do, uh, I say I do. It's uh, Northern Ireland is, is one where I just do, um, I say, um, it's like, you know, get out get out of the car now. I just go, get, get, out of the, get out of the car now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's, that's the only one I can do. Um, <laughs> it's, an, it's that intimidation, isn't it? It's that, isn't it? It's yeah, like, it's the, they'd yeah. be like Glaswegian as well. I see you, Paul. You're lucky. You, 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 you're gonna bang him. <laughs> yeah, it's the when well, the thing is with that. Like my uh, my granddad, he, um, he he's Scottish, and um, growing up, he had a very strong Scottish accent. He'd talk to me, and I'd just be like, "Yeah," because I didn't have a I didn't have a clue what he was saying to me. Um, yeah. So we'll, we'll move on from the accents. We could we could be here, <laughs> we could be here all day. <laughs> all right. I'll put in the request. We should, I should have done it before. Request request for James Murray doing accent. Yeah. Um, so what about you, you kind of, um, one, one thing I did want to ask, obviously the COVID situation and your work. Mm. Yeah. What, what's that been like for you for the last 12 months? Um, it's been difficult. Uh, oh, sorry. Drop me phone. Um, yeah, it has been tough. Um, so for example, um, <laughs> when it all kicked off, I was in the middle of doing an advert for a Swiss supermarket. Um, you get these random jobs. Um, a lot of European um, retailers like to use British actors for, um, for for their stuff. Anyway, so beginning of February, I'd film the interior stuff in Zurich. And then in the winter months, in the darker months, they like to use the Southern Hemisphere for the outdoor filming because yeah. you get a, a longer filming day, basically, because you've got more oh, sunshine. Yeah. And so I was all I was all booked up. My passport was at the South African Embassy in London, um, two weeks in Cape Town. Um, and then 
this everything kicked off and I lost that job. Um, oh, they just no. they just canned it. Um, I remember the South African embassy called me up saying, um, yeah, your, your passport's here um, and the chances are that we're going to have to close next week. I was like, well, yeah, I want it back. And I was like, oh, 20 quid to courier, courier, courier it to you. Um, and then after that, yeah, um, in the first bit, the, the first lockdown, obviously no filming happened at all. Yeah. Um, and then there's COVID safe stuff allowed now. Um uh so i've i've predominantly apart from doing a special for waffle um i've predominantly just been doing um role play stuff uh, with the military and with um with, with in medical scenarios like playing patients and stuff which is always good fun but yeah a lot of people people who uh mostly do theater they've had it worse because obviously the theaters have been dark yeah. for um, yeah. 12 months now and it's not just the actors as well it's the um uh, the, the you know the tech crews and everything um it's 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 been a tough time but hopefully um we can see some kind of light at the end of the tunnel now just keep getting those needles into people's arms yeah i hope so yeah i mean it, it's one thing it was it, at the start as you mentioned the first lockdown you know, there's things like, you know, EastEnders stopped, didn't it? And, and things like that. And you kind of think, yeah. wow, for kind of, you know, things like that to stop and halt filming because of COVID, it kind of, it did put everything in perspective. But then when it when you went on a number of months and, and the, you know, the COVID safe filming took place, you know, there's there's a lot of things. You look at it and you see pictures and stuff on, on social media and, you know, you'll obviously know more than me. And you kind of think, you know, fair play. These people have put in a hell of a lot of effort and, and done so many good things to be able to to carry on with filming on on a number of things in there. Absolutely, and um, I think it was I can't remember what it, whether it was Coronation Street a couple of weeks ago. People were giving it a hard time because I think one of the characters found one of their relatives dead on the sofa or something, and people were saying, "Oh, why didn't you go up to them and you know shake them and try and see if they're alive?" And you're like, "Well, you can't. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. the actors have got, have, have got to stay." Um, two meters apart and they're doing their best and you know it only takes one transmission on a tv set as you saw you do you see the tom cruise thing where he went bananas no. um uh, tom cruise i think he's filming in italy and i think a couple of the members of the crew um didn't have their masks on and they were talking to each other face to face um he was effing and blinding they released the audio of it um, and I think it's a film that he's invested in as well, um, personally, financially. All it takes is one case and, and filming gets shut down and all those people lose their jobs. All that money is wasted. Um, so you've just got to remember that you don't make a mistake. Otherwise, people are going to you know, lose houses and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I find it, it's kind of got to the point now. I watch TV shows and obviously if I see something that is old or you know a couple of years old and you see people gathering and they're close together and stuff like that. you think how are they doing that what, there's no social distancing do you know <laughs> it's got to the, yeah. it's got to a point you, you see that and it kind of takes takes you back doesn't it yeah i can't remember last time i um i shook somebody's hand or anything like that it's um yeah it is it is weird but hopefully as we say hopefully it's the end and the end is in sight now um let's talk about um this is what um you know my, my children that my children finally recognise a guest that I've, I've interviewed on the show. Um, <laughs> Brilliant. So let's talk about talk about Waffle. What is it? Waffle, yeah, the, waffle. waffle the Wonder Dog. Waffle the Wonder Dog on CBBS is what um, I've predominantly been doing over the past um, three or four years. Um, yeah, auditioned for it, um, saw the script, and it said yeah, he's a teacher, a primary school teacher. And I mentioned that I do a lot of education work myself anyway. Yeah. I was, uh, and he loves dogs, and I do like. I don't have a dog because I don't think it'd be fair because of my work commitments. But um, I was like, I'm having this. This is mine. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I did one audition, got it, and had an absolute hoot filming it. It was great fun. Um, uh, it's all done now, sadly. Um, I, there's not going to be any more series after oh, no. the special that we did last year. Well, they, the kids are getting bigger. Um, you know, they're, they're getting older. And also with children's television, CBeebies is aimed at, what, two to seven? So just that five-year window. Yeah. And um, a, a new generation of viewers comes along. Yeah. Um, and then so they can recycle. I think we've got 60-something episodes out there. So um, we could, yeah, they can just recycle that until a new generation of kids comes along. So yes, yeah, sadly, no more waffle, no, but no. it will still be out there for many years. 
Yeah, it certainly will. I mean, it's it's obviously we you know we've watched it. Not not me, not because of me, but because of the kids. We we all watch it, and it's um you know obviously it's, it's a great show. What about um you mentioned one of them before we we started recording. What about any any kind of stories that you've got from filming? Um you know that that you that you, you you can tell us. Uh, yeah, when I fall in the mud, when I'm running around in my dressing gown, I actually did genuinely uh, dislocate my shoulder. They had to suspend filming for the day. Um, obviously, there's a stunt double that does some of the really scary stuff. Um, but they wanted me just to do the two foot fall of me falling flat in the mud, which I did, um, and just landed awkwardly, <laughs> popped my shoulder, rushed me off to the hospital and, um, yeah, put my shoulder back in. <laughs> So that was probably the most dramatic. Um, so when you watch that episode, think of that. And the other thing which I'd like to say to the Villa fans is always look out for Simon's costume uh, because I did get to have some choice in the colour schemes and stuff. And quite often you'll see Simon wearing either a claret T-shirt, a claret tie, um, claret tie paired with a light blue shirt, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I'm always trying to uh, get a little bit of Villa colouring into, in, into Waffle. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's what it's all about. I mean, when, when I was younger, I wore braces and um, they said, oh, you can have them coloured. And I was like, yeah, I'll have claret and blue. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, uh, a, a little known fact as well. Dad's army, you with yeah. me? Yeah, Ian, Ian, Ian Lavender, isn't it? Yeah. Ian Lavender, Erdington boy, same um, same as me. And he, yeah, he, apparently he went into the BBC wardrobe and they said, oh, our director wants you to wear a, wear a scarf. He's a bit of a wimp. Um, and he picked the claret and blue one up, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. Now that's good. I, I see, I'm going to be watching it now, waffle, and, and, <laughs> and looking out for the claret and blue, and I'll be yeah. t- and I'll, I'll be I'll be saying to the missus, look, what colours is he wearing? Um, another thing that I quite enjoy on waffle is obviously you do you do singing on waffle, don't you? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. We do singing waffle docket. They actually had to coach me in guitar playing for it How because really? I could I could play a few chords. Yeah. Um, but I did have to have some extra lessons for that um, because it was a little bit uh, beyond my, uh, my my abilities. What about what about singing? Because you know you've got a pretty pretty decent voice. It's you know it's it's pretty good. Shall I let you into a secret, Chris? Go on then. I don't sing the theme tune. Really. No, <laughs> in the intro and the outro credits, um, it's a guy, a guy, a, a guy called Kai who sings, um, sings that um, the, the actual theme tune. Um, yeah, so that's disappointed you, wasn't it? I'm sorry. Oh no, yeah, disappointed <laughs> now. Um, yeah, we were probably going to ask me to get my guitar out or something. Like I was. That. I, th- I thought we could have a sing song and we could sing along. <laughs> Hang on a minute. Hang on a second. Hang on. Just let me because I've got to plug my phone in. Can you still see me? All right. Yep, we can see you. We can see the claret and blue. Oh. No idea whether this is in tune or not. <clears throat> Let's have a look. Oh. oh, waffle. Oh, waffle. Leaping around like a frog. I just want to say one thing. It's really out of tune, this guitar. I'm sorry. It's all right. You're such a clever dog. Is that right for you? Yeah, love it. <laughs> see, because I am... Um, my my little girl, she's nine months old, and um, I don't know why, I don't know why I did it, but I started singing along, and I was there going because she's called Lily. I go oh, wa yeah. wa for Lily, and I, I, I sang that to her from a young age. And now, if I start singing it to her, I'll just go, and I'll go. So many nights spent awake, and then she'll turn and start smiling at me. Well, yeah, she probably did keep you awake for a while. Oh God, so still does, still does. Not, 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 not barking like waffle, but you know, you know what it's like. But uh, yeah, oh no, it's not no, nice. That was so. Uh, what, what about so? So you don't do any of the singing. So when you sat there on the guitar, that, I no, take it when it's you. when it's when it's when it's live in a scene, it's me. Yeah. Um, but the the intro credits and the and and the, and the outro, that's that's not me. That's a professional musician. There you go. You've got my you've got my confession for the day. I'm gonna I'm gonna cut it. I'm gonna cut it out of the filming because I want to <laughs> believe I want to believe that it's you singing all the time because I love it. <laughs> um, right b- before we finish, I um, just want to do some some quick fire questions that we usually do. So um, it's good, go it'd be mainly about Villa. Um, I'll throw them at you. Just think of what, yeah, what comes Looking what comes what, what comes to your head first. Okay, so your favourite. All time Aston Villa player. 
<laughs> Jack Grealish. I know that's so, that's so, I just, I can't think of anybody who's excited me as much over the past few, over the past few years. I should have gone with someone from the 90s, but I can't. No, no, I, I agree with you. I, um, it's a tough one, but yeah, it always comes back to Jack for me. Uh, Favourite manager, Villa manager? Oh, um, Ron Atkinson. Um, for those um, those early nineties years, yeah, he was he was the, the the typical British manager, wasn't he? He'd always have a bit a big watch and a uh, you know a few rings on his fingers, big, um, big coat, yeah, big Ron, yeah, yeah. He'd, he'd probably be my, my the, the manager that sticks in my mind. Although I was I was looking at um I was looking at this program. What I was saying, my first game Villa against Starbuck, and the manager was Bengloss, Doctor Joseph Bengloss. Oh, um, and a lot of people forget that how I suppose how um, leading the way Villa were in having a foreign coach. Yeah, I don't know whether we were the first. I doubt we were the first, but um, in the nineties, yeah, that was that was that was quite groundbreaking. Yeah, yeah, no, God, I forgot about him. Joe what, Joe Bengloss. what a manager. Um, you've 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 got a couple on display for us. What is your favourite um, Aston Villa kit? <laughs> Um, my favourite of recent years would be the one that I chose. Um, yep. the, 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 the O'Neill e- era, the one yep. that I chose to wear for this. Um, because as we've discussed, um, we were quite good. Yep. Um, and also, I think I, I don't know, the Nike it was just clean, wasn't it? I think they did a round neck version of it as well. Um, in, in, in the following year, yep. um, but there was, there was no best. And also, the fact that we were the first team to have uh, a charity on the shirt. That was something to be proud about as a Villa fan. You know, it's before Barca had um, UNICEF on theirs. Yep. Um, so, I, I, yeah, that, that, probably this one from recent years. Um, but, yeah, probably um, pr- probably the Mitre copy as one from when I was a kid would be my favourite. Yeah, that's a good can I, can I share something? Uh, talking about shirts, can I share something I've got down here with you? Yes, you can. Oh, I've had to take it off the dining room wall. Oh, I've got that on my dining room wall that I managed to get signed by a handful of the European Cup winners. It's obviously a, a replica shirt. It's yeah. not an original. Yep. Um, otherwise, I'd have it in a safe somewhere. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's um, that's that that's also one of my probably my we got we got burgled a few years ago, and the first thing I wanted to know was is the shirt still on the wall? Oh God, yeah, you'd want to. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, so everyone, everyone who's listening who isn't watching on YouTube, but James has just showed us a framed um, copy of the 1982 European Cup final winners shirt, which is signed by a few of the players. Do you know? Do you know who signed it? Um, it's got Pat Hurd, Tony Morley, Colin Gibson, uh, Mortimer, Dennis Mortimer, and some of the others I can't make out. Um, I actually got it done. I bought I bought the shirt from the club shop, and um, I don't really remember the Villa All Stars. Neil Neil Rioch used to run the Villa All Stars, and um, his wife is a family friend um, of my aunt's. And I, she said, "Just give me the shirt, and then when he goes off to one of his charity games, he'll get a few signatures for you." And when it came back, I was just like, "Wow, that's that's amazing! It's probably one of my prized possessions." Amazing, amazing. I'll uh, yeah, you have to. Um... Make sure you you handle that one with care. Yeah, well, it's all tucked away behind the glass. Um, so yeah, although my, my missus keeps saying, "Oh, when can we change that? When can we move it?" Never. Yeah, no, <laughs> no. no. Um, your favourite all-time Aston Villa goal? Wow, gosh, that's a tough one. It's a tough one, isn't it? I'm gonna go with. Savo winning the League Cup against Leeds. Or was it the second or the third goal? It might be the th- might be the third. I think he was outside the area screaming yeah, because he he'd got such a hard time, hadn't he? Um, yeah. And you know he, he wasn't his time with the club wasn't exactly glorious. And, and I, th- I suppose you describe him now more of a cult figure than a hero. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's one that sticks in my mind of watching it. Um, yeah, I'm going to go for that. Yeah, it's a great goal. It's a great goal. And what about your favourite Aston Villa game that you've been to? Um, going back to what I said earlier, for the atmosphere, 
um, the Atletico Madrid one. I also remember that um, that bonkers Blackburn night. I was in the hole for that. Was it seven four a few years ago? Uh, I think it. Yeah, I think it was. It was either six or seven four. Yeah, but uh, yeah, that was that was a great game. That was because we. I think we were, t- we were two 0 down, weren't we? Pretty early on. Yeah, and it was just a ding, ding dong, goal, goal, goal. I remember Milner got a, got a few, didn't he, or two or something like that. Yeah. Um, so that was good. I can also remember. So going back a bit, I think it's still our biggest Premier League win because Liverpool scored two a few few months ago. Uh, Wimbledon seven one. I can remember us winning seven one um, at Villa Park against Wimbledon. That would have been about ninety four something like that. Yeah. Um, is it- I'm sure someone got a hat trick in that game. Is it York or, or Saunders, possibly? Yeah, the likes of those players. Um, I, don't, I can't remember. I think Wimbledon still had um, Vinnie Jones playing for them, maybe. Um, yeah, it was, yeah, he would, would have been around then, yeah. Certainly that that kind of era, that sticks in the mind. Um, away games, I'm trying to think of some of the away games that stick in, stick in the mind. Um, I can remember going to Highfield Road as a kid with my dad, him being a, uh, a cough fan. That was a proper old, proper old ground, um, Highfield Road. Um, I'm trying to think of probably the most random place I've been. Random place going away, Oxford United, Catsam Stadium, three-sided stadium. That's a weird place. Um, freezing in the second round of the League Club Cup, something like that. Um, but yeah, they would they would be amongst my favourite games that I've been to. Nice. Uh, we'll touch touch on your career. What's your, your favourite waffle episode that you filmed? Uh, favourite episode, the paint one, where we all get covered in green paint because um, I got the chance to throw a whole can of paint at the rest of the family, at Doug, Evie and, um, and Jess. And of course, you have to remember that when you're filming something like that, you uh, you, you pretty much only got one chance yeah. because it will take the art department who do the set, uh, you know, best part of a day, maybe half a day to redecorate that room. Yeah. Um, so we rehearsed it. And when I fall into the ladder, grab the paint and then throw it back towards the family. Um, and I can remember it making a bit of a slapping noise on Doug. So that Doug's the young my, my son in it I can remember the, the paint making a bit of a slapping noise as it, as it hit his face and I was like oh yes that's the shot yeah. <laughs> so yes. that's my favourite no I think there'd be a lot of people who would have you know would like to you know it's, it's, it's kind of when you're doing you're decorating you're like I'd love to just throw this at someone right now you know the, the <laughs> wife um, <laughs> what about um, so uh, in, you, in your obviously acting career the favourite kind of person that you've that you've worked with um, favorite person that I've worked with. Um, I, say, I, I say person; it could be a dog as well. If it, no, nah, no. Um, I actually. Um, so one of my first ever professional jobs when I was going back to what I was saying about the Birmingham Stage School, I did the pantomime at the Birmingham Hippodrome in '92. So I would have been ten, and they always had like a group of kids in the panto then from a local drama school, and playing buttons. And I only remember this because he's, he's passed on recently. Um, Des O'Connor. Oh, the legend, wow. the, the TV legend that is Des O'Connor was playing buttons yeah. in that. Um, and he was great with all those kids, you know. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it, I, I, I can't really think of anybody um, more famous um, that, that I've worked with than him. And yeah, that was one of my first jobs. Oh, amazing, amazing, amazing. I got my mum to dig out a photo. I put it up on um, Instagram um, of me with him from when I was 10. Send her up to the loft. I was like, Des O'Connor's died. Go and find my photos. <laughs> <laughs> Go find it. I need to post it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, well, I won't keep you any longer. I know you're, you're a busy man, uh, but a massive, massive thanks uh, for coming on. Um, for just, it's been a just, pleasure. Just before we finish, um, for everyone who's listening and is not looking on YouTube, um, James is wearing claret and blue. He's got a, an Aston Villa blanket in the background over his mirror. He's got two shirts behind him as well. Also the shirt in a frame. So James literally bleeds claret and blue. Um, so massive, massive thanks. It's, it's been amazing to talk to you about your Villa memories, how you became a fan, and obviously your career. Um, obviously, a lot of people watching who do have young children that will recognise James from Waffle the Wonder Dog, um, which is which is on quite often in my house. Um, but as he's disappointed me a couple of times with his, his stories about the fact that he's not the one singing at the start uh, or the end. <laughs> of the show and the fact that they're not doing any more. Um, so, yeah. 
Sorry uh, about that, but Chris, it's been an absolute pleasure and a nice break from this um, this this lockdown business to just sit here and talk football. Thanks for having me. We we could do it all day, but um, so yeah. yeah, but 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 any time, drop me a message. But massive thank you um, to Mr. James Merry for joining us. Massive thanks. Uh, we've been Villa together. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>